Hello, everyone. So I want to start right out with a question about who is responsible for kind of this new wave of corporate social responsibility, of interest in companies doing good. I think a lot of people have said that it is millennials. As an old millennial, I am happy to take that on. <laughs> but I want to know if you, how much truth you guys think there is to that. Is this kind of a generational shift? Are people responding to what millennials really want? Or is this something else? I want to start with you. Well, uh, thank you, and thank you for, for having us um, today. And thanks to Laureate, who stands as quite a, quite a proof point in this uh, space um, for sponsoring. I think the answer is it's everybody. I mean, for me, it's everybody uh, has a role to play in what we think of as a movement, a larger movement. Um, and the, the nice thing about millennials is I think they just have that attitude built in. If I think about what's going to tip the movement, I would probably lean towards millennials but more importantly, women, and women of all ages simply because of wealth transfer. Yeah, I think there's um, some interesting trends that have been happening. So when I was at Goldman, one of the things that we were constantly seeing is people didn't want to stay in their jobs if they didn't feel like it was having impact in any way. So they'll come for two years or three years, but when you're in a company, two to three years is not a long time. And what you want to do is retain people. So I think the millennials in one way are just pushing not just from wanting to invest differently, but they want to work in companies and places where they feel like they're having impact. Second is I think investors are feeling that if, or especially philanthropists, they're feeling if I'm giving away money, why wouldn't I think about investing money differently? And how do I think mm -hmm. about companies that do that? And what are, what are the ways we might do that differently? And third, I think companies are feeling the responsibility themselves because you no longer can just operate and do business as you were. The license to operate is changing, so you're trying to attract workers, but you're also trying to work in communities, and that's starting to shift. Yeah, yeah I, I certainly think um, millennials are saying and articulating this is, this is our expectation of corporate America, and so we're listening and responding to that. I think where we're not seeing them is in the marketplace. They aren't necessarily yet making consumption decisions and rewarding brands for the efforts. Um, so I think we as brands um, need to pull them in and tell the story and produce the product that will make them you know, reward us in the marketplace. Also, um, you know, it's a pool and what millennials are looking for and expecting as an employer um, is also a motivator for us to, to change practice and to look at what we're doing and to respond to that expectation of how we operate and how we um, reward and work with them as an employee. I'll echo that. I think that when it comes to recruitment and retention of millennials, um, impact is a driving factor in what people are looking for in a, in a career. Um, but also, more broadly, with increased transparency around uh, business practices, companies are realizing that um, they put themselves at risk if they're not um, promoting responsible practices. And we're seeing more of those integrated into day-to-day um, -day business. I want to talk about that transparency factor for a second. Um, there's been a lot of speculation that the reason brands are more concerned with what they're doing and being transparent and ethical behavior is because they have to have a presence on things like Twitter and Facebook and people have more of a chance to connect with them and talk to them and also to complain about things and say actually this company isn't doing X or we would like them to do Y. How big of a factor do you think social media and the technology that kind of closes in the world a little bit. How much of a factor is that in this new wave? Elizabeth? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I definitely think that it's a, a driving factor because companies can no longer kind of cordon themselves off and not um, interact with their, the marketplace, the communities that are touched by their business. Um, it changes the dynamic between the company and who their stakeholders are. It's, an it's a really important factor. And Sunal, you have been working in this field for quite some time. I'm wondering how you've seen kind of traditional CSR models change over time. Yeah, it used to be that CSR was one portion of a company. And you're like, I have my CSR shop, I have my community engagement shop, and then I have uh, my business. And no longer is that an OK operational model. So CSR is being asked to be a much bigger part of what the company is doing. And community engagement, people don't want to just go paint another school. They want to actively engage in what they're doing. So I'll give you a great example. Blackstone, you know, when they started their impact fund, didn't start because the company cared about it. Blackstone started it because a group of young people decided that they were going to talk to everybody in the field in social impact investing, and they were going to force the company to move in that direction. And that's how it started. But I think you're seeing more of that. Walmart's doing it in Puerto Rico right now, where they're actively working on opening up supply chain lines where they, it's no longer just the CSR shop, but it's much more integrated into the business line. So I think that 
uh, and it leads to the transparency question, which is people are saying, well, what company is doing what and how are they doing it? And social media is making it much more available to, for information on who's doing what, but it's forcing reaction in a faster way. Remember when CSR used to be the bleeding edge of you know, social impact? Yeah. And now, you know, the way I look at it is like you have this spectrum of where you can be as a company on social impact. And CSR is almost on the left That's end of that spectrum now. And then so some of the things you were talking about get us farther into the space of being very intentional about working it into your business line. So not just a kind of good thing to do, a volunteering thing, but really intentionally companies like Danone, you know, buying and acquiring impact companies because it actually helps them get market yeah. um, space and, and customers. And so that's kind of the far end of this. And then on the transparency stuff, you'll be talking to Jay later, I mean, but about being able to measure what matters and having almost intrapreneurs in companies, so to your point, say, I want my company to be better. How do I do that and pick some of these business lines that you can get on with their measure of what matters piece and see where does my company fit and then start to move it along. So I think there's really cool sp yeah. stuff happening in the measurement and transparency space. Yeah, I think you know, CSR is now table stakes. I mean, I think it's just what's expected from companies. And what I think I've seen in evolution is from where it was sort of a siloed team that was coming up with ideas in the company, it's now across the functions. Mm -hmm. You see the designers looking to innovate, on make more sustainable product. You see the transportation logistics team looking on how do we reduce emissions. You see the innovation team coming up with new processes and programs. And it isn't led necessarily out of the sustainability or the CSR team. It's them you know, really taking it on and embedding it and changing how we operate and the product we produce. Yeah. So when I talk to brands a lot of times, especially about things that they're doing to try and have a positive social impact, the thing that they seem very frustrated by is the fact that anytime they promote something that they did that was good, it'll be seen as PR. Um, and they'll get a lot of skepticism and a lot of criticism for that. And a lot of the things that you were just talking about when it comes to the business line is not something that consumers necessarily see. I'm wondering how brands think about balancing the idea of doing good just as a general business principle versus kind of the things that are public facing and might be criticized as PR. Yeah, I mean, I, no good deed goes unpunished. I, you know, having been at Levi's for a while, I've come to, come to learn that. Um, but I think it's authenticity. And I think we're fortunate at Levi's in that we're, we have, we're a 165-year-old company, and our founder, Levi Strauss, with his Judeo values, has been living the CSR, you know, through the, what he dropped, he passed on to generations. And so we have an authenticity that we bring to the table, and I think that's what you need to not have it thrown back as PR, is a long narrative of having made these investments and caring about it and showing it from leadership um, through to your employees who are in the stores who are facing consumers and having them live and speak the language. Can I just add to that? Yeah, Which I absolutely. think authenticity is such a key, question, a key comment. And it is about, it's no longer just, oh, there's all these things happening, let us go talk to our communication shop, they're gonna tell us what to say and then we're gonna do it. It's now being much more real about, is this a consistent way you operate or is this a one-time thing that you've done or is this the business operations, as in Levi's, to, to really operate that way? And I think that's what consumers are also looking for, but I think it's what society is looking for. We're tired of being told that this is a PR thing and listen to our PR thing and then our business is running this way, but more if it's happening on a consistent basis, you know it. We're not morons <laughs> as consumers. <laughs> I want that bumper sticker. <laughs> and I think it's also like, I love authenticity, but it's also um, maybe intentionality, right? Is also a key piece of, of how you go about this and, um, and not being afraid to talk about the people who are coming at it from a social impact perspective as a, this is also a money-making venture. So really quite intentionally saying, I can run at purpose and profit at the same time because it's good for business as well as being good for the world. And being able to have those conversations and transparently talk about them and measure them, um, I think is also yeah. key to defending, right? And, and being willing to talk about it. All right, I want to come back to that in a second. Elizabeth, did you have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add that in addition to the authenticity factor, um, being able to show impact is really important as well. Um, we work with a client that uh, is a beauty company philosophy and 1% of their um, profits goes to a women's mental health fund. And 
um, as part of that, we've built out a network of advisors who are experts in uh, women's mental health and have done a really deep dive in looking at how do you reach grassroots communities serving women with mental health issues. So being able to have the outward public facing part, but then also actually if someone wanted to really do a deep dive into the impact of that, being able to stand really proud next to the results that that fund is driving um, is a critical part as well. Yeah. So Sheila, I want to come back to the idea of kind of facing brands and saying you can do ethical work and it can also be really profitable. And obviously that's appealing internally to a brand. I'm wondering how that sells to consumers, how that works public facing. Do you think that that makes people critical as soon as you bring profits into the equation? Um, you know, my experience is that there is still this general feeling, and you see it in this space, you see it in the larger global development space, of private sector is evil. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and it's really, like, I don't know why I continue to be surprised, because it just exists. Um, but I think you have to push through that. And so part of the way, you know, we do that at the Case Foundation is to get out case studies, to make them accessible, to talk about it a lot with examples, like Revolution Foods, which has gone out and talked about we are shameless about making profit, but we are also shameless about measuring social impact, and we are merging the two, and actually we're getting market rate returns. So how, you know, so being able to get some of those stories out there and try to mesh this world of private sector actually can be one of the greatest driving forces for social issues, um, and how do we embrace that and get stories out there and share them more broadly? So how do we, how do we, create that space for the conversation at a minimum, and show impact at maximum. Yeah. So as I report more in this space, the thing that I've been hearing a lot about recently is impact investing. Um, and I'm wondering, Sanal, I'll start with you, what you think about the growth in that area? Uh, I think it's one of the best things that's been happening, actually, and it's forcing this conversation that Sheila's been talking about, which is profit with purpose and not being shy about that. Impact investing is a very broad space, so it's nonprofits operating differently that can bring private sector investors in, and it's Revolution Foods, where you're a business that's operating differently, where mission is a part of everything you're doing. And I think Jay, who will speak later, is gonna talk a lot about why uh, B Corp and what they're doing and the types of businesses that get started are just operating differently. That is impact at its core, and it's a business, and we're gonna make profit on it, but I think the idea that we can also use our investment dollars to do good and use philanthropy for other, you know, to also do good, but why not both? Why just one? Why one checkbook? One is 100% loss and the other might give you a 1% gain. Why not the 1% gain? Why, why do we talk about below market returns, above market returns? We should be thinking about investments that can do both good, make money, but also investments that might do good and return a little bit of money, but we can have that whole spectrum. And I, the generation that's pushing, the millennials that are pushing it, hats off to them, and I hope they keep pushing it because this is what it's gonna take to, for us to think differently. So earlier we talked a little bit about the spectrum that we have and CSR being something that used to be kind of cutting edge and now kind of being the bare minimum. I'm wondering if you guys think that brands continually will have to move along that spectrum and become more and more and more entrenched in this in order to be taken seriously. And I, I want to start with you. Yeah, and I think, I think the proof will come in the, you know, the triple glide line approach, that it's not just a nice to do. I mean, certainly for brands, that your big strongest asset is your brand, and you, that protecting that brand and reputation is essential to maintaining your business. But also, you know, the demo, you know, what's coming out from the Economist showing that businesses that take that triple line approach, they actually grow, they're more healthy, and the more sort of economic and business evidence we have to the case, I think will only, you know, move everyone in that direction. Jill, I want you to weigh in on that since you were talking a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I mean, I love where, where Anna's going on more proof points um, because the more proof points we have and the more data we have and the more research we have on this profitability portion of both impact and diversity of our leadership teams, I think um, it's going to make a difference. I think there is a real leadership gap in politics and policy and government, um, which used to cover kind of the social space. And CEOs of major corporations are stepping into that gap. I really hope I'm right um, by believing, really believing, that corporates are going to lead the way on social impact. They are going to take that space and they are going to run with it and do incredible good in the world. And they will be the companies that, um, that are around. 
What are the things that you think politicians used to do in that gap and used to do in that void that CEOs are now doing? Well, if you think about, you know, just sort of politicians and government being um, the states, states people, right? I mean, they're out there talking about the importance of covering um, wealth gap, social issues, um, and that has gone away a bit. It's seeded the policy space on issues of income and education and all of these things that used to be driven by government. Um, is just quieted down now in a kind of toxic atmosphere on politics. And I think CEOs are, are sitting there thinking, we can do something, we are going to step in. You see Howard Schultz of Starbucks. I mean, I'd listen to him any day talk about why investing in veterans is important. Um, and so I think they're just gonna hopefully fill that gap and drive it forward. I'm wondering, do you guys agree with that? Do you, A, feel the gap, and B, do you think that CEOs and companies are stepping in to fill it? Absolutely, and I think that our stakeholders are expecting it of us. I mean, I see, um, I mean, I think we saw with the election, we knew there were certain stakeholders that we've been in dialogue with around environmental and social issues that were focused mostly with us on how do we get legislation passed to advance this goal. And when they don't see that that's going to be happening in the near term, they're looking to us to voluntarily do it. And so I think there's both a stepping into it, but there's also going to be a lot of um, our stakeholders, consumers, NGOs, trade unions putting pressure on all of us to voluntarily step in and fill the leadership gap. I have another question or two for our panel, but I do want to let you guys know that we'll be coming to you for questions. So start thinking about them now, condensing them all the way down, and <laughs> we'll get back to you soon. So, one of the questions that I have a lot about this is that when we think about social impact, when we think about millennials, all of those things kind of get siloed into the U.S. and thinking about how U.S. companies are changing. But this push is really a global one, is it not? So, um, and I'm going to start with you. Can you talk to me a little bit about how this space is changing globally? Yeah, I mean, I think we've always, we're a global brand. We were, you know, founded in the United States. It's our biggest market, but we're in 110 countries around the world. So we really have an eye on the global marketplace. And Europe for us is a big motivator to do a lot of the things we're doing, both because there is the legislative regulatory push to action, and there is a big consumer push. That is a place where consumers are looking to buy a sustainable product and have high expectations of the brands in their market. And so that's really been a different context and a big motivator for the global brands like Levi's. I think, I think impact investing globally is almost faster than domestically. In many ways, this is a late conversation coming to the US, and that's probably in the last five or seven years. But globally, this conversation's been happening. How do we think about schools? How do we do public-private partnerships in schools? How do we think about healthcare differently? How do we think about um, energy differently? That's been happening already, and we're just catching up. And I, are, we're moving it faster because we have more money here. But globally, this is a conversation. And I think to Anna's point, a lot more governments are paying attention to what are the brands doing in their countries and how are they operating sustainably because they're forced to have to deal with that conversation more directly. Yeah, Shirley, you agree with that? I totally agree with that. Um, <laughs> and, and, and also just some of the products, the investment products, Europe's way ahead of the US. We're lear I feel like we're learning from them. Um, and so I always find it kind of cute, right? When it's like the US leading the way in impact investing. <laughs> so yeah. I hope that, that uh, we earn that title. All right, and I have a final lightning question for all of you, which is in the next three to five years, what do you think the biggest advancement innovation in this space is going to be? Dylan, sorry, you're sitting next to me, so you're first. Um, the biggest advance, I think, is that really where I started, which is women are sitting in a space where they, once they take care of their own financial needs, they take more risk than others. And I think they, that coupled with the wealth transfer that's coming to women is that women are going to lead the way in impact investing. I want to just add to hers and to say, <laughs> um, while I think that's true, I also think more and more we're going to see impact as the risk measure. So if you're not doing impact as a company, you're going to, that's going to be a risk for you. And it's no longer just going to be, there's other risks, but impact is going to be the risk we look at. I think it'll be a move towards circularity and how, you know, investments in enabling businesses to close the loop, to take their product back and, and make it into a product again. Um, that, you know, the reducing the waste and all the environmental impacts around energy, water, chemicals that go with it. 
So there's a, there's a real opportunity for um, ultra high net worth individuals and CEOs to look at their um, philanthropy, but at their personal philanthropy, and also at the impact that their companies are making, and to think about it holistically and how can business practices augmented by some personal giving really make a fundamental shift in kind of some of societal issues. All right, I want to make sure if you guys have questions, you're able to get them in. So if you do, all the way back there. Good morning. This is Ryan Rudeminer. Uh, this is an amazing panel. Um, I'm with R2 Strategic Consulting, and my question is, what is the one top lesson that you learned from 2017 as we approach 2018 that you think is going to become a trend that we should pay attention to? All right. Did you guys get that? Top lesson from 2017 is going to become a trend for 2018. <laughs> One? <laughs> I think you're going to see a lot more funds getting created, whether it's for women invest, women oriented investment funds, minority invested uh, or investment funds that are really going to start seeing impact. Whether I think the next one of the conversations you're going to be having on artists, you're, it's not, it's going to move beyond just traditional impact investing to much more places that we haven't seen. And I think that trend's only going to increase over time. I think we touched on it already. I think it's the you know leaders of companies stepping in um, and taking on leadership roles and being a voice for, for issues and for the business change that needs to happen. Yeah, I would add to that. Um, you know, we've seen an increased rise in populism, and how can we use the voices of people to actually steer that into benefit and to influence um, business practices? So I would say one of the big lessons for. 2017 is you know, the empowered individual and um, what is the potential of that when steered toward um, societal impact. And I would say um, the biggest lesson for me has been the under leveraging of diversity. Um, and so really bringing together this intersectionality which all the data is starting to prove about being very intentional about both diversity in your leadership teams as well as diversity as an investment proposition um, with the intersectionality on impact, and I think that is going to really scale going forward. All right. Hi, my name is Patty Simonton. I'm with Radial Impact. Um, so Jeff Bezos, Steve Case, um, you know JD Vance, they just <laughs> launched a uh, investment fund, essentially the wealthiest of the wealthy, coming together to support the red state like uh, startups in those areas. There's only two women on that whole group that I was able to to identify. My concern is that they're not really focusing at all on, on social impact or impact investing for what they're doing. And you know, to me, reading that and knowing that they're going specifically after the profits, where can we focus our energy as a community? If the wealthiest of the wealthy among us, the ones leading the multinational companies that we're talking about, aren't even willing to take that step. So I want to give you a chance to respond to that. You know, I think it, that there's still a, well, first of all, all investing has impact, right? And so I think it comes back to this idea of the intentionality that you want to bring to your investments to transparency and measurement of social impact when you do it. Um, and so I think that that is where we have to do, continue to do some more work with high net worth individuals, with funds, on figuring out, you know, how do we continue to make the case that this is a high return business. We do have some of those proof points, um, but the data and research to continue to drive that forward is something that we're certainly investing in the Case Foundation, and I know um, others are too. Sonal does a lot of work in this area, and we just have to continue on the hard work of making that case. I'm John Craig, I'm with uh, can rock and roll save America. I wanted to point out uh, <laughs> that the most famous commercial probably in the world was Steve Jobs' 1984 Super Bowl commercial, airing to males. The basic thing is a young woman hurling a sledgehammer at a dictatorial figure. The Google guy said, don't be evil. What role will women have in bringing down this image of corporate evil because it's so endemic? We addressed it. I thought maybe you could speak more directly to that. Oh, no, I think you. So I think you raise uh, such an interesting point. As so much the stories of women don't get told, and many times we always talk about the the iconic leader like Steve Jobs, but we never talk about all of the people underneath 
who were actually the driving force behind it. So my request is more actually a, a back to you all to say, why aren't we telling those stories? And why are we okay with the Steve Jobs story and not the other 20 stories? Why don't we talk about Lorraine Powell Jobs, who's actually been doing more in impact than Steve Jobs ever did, but yet every time somebody talks about impact, they talk about Steve Jobs, they don't talk about what Lorraine Powell Jobs has been investing in. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us to force ourselves to ask these questions. Even we have an all women panel up here talking about impact. Why aren't there more women on these panels talking about it? Why aren't there more women being highlighted about it? But I think that's our job. Um, but I think that's a, that's a call to all of you to say, force every conversation to make sure that those women are being prom promoted at the same time. And a role for journalism, right? Which is, you know, we launched a uh, Faces of Founders campaign at the Case Foundation largely because, and this is a serious story, we Googled successful entrepreneurs and we got an entire screen of white male. An entire screen. Um, and so we really started backing into this idea of storytelling and default images. And a lot of that is created by journalists, um, by public media. And so how do we start disrupting that space with stories, what, what Solon was saying, but really importantly with images so that you create this idea of, you know, for a young black girl looking up saying, huh, I can be that. That's a CEO who looks like me. That is an entrepreneur who looks like me. Um, and so I think there's an incredible amount of room to do in that yeah. space. And we all play a role um, in doing that and holding people accountable. Everyone, please join me in thanking our panel.